We now move to the last part of this introduction and we'll discuss about the inspiring discovery of the electron spin. As a starter, we'll first discuss about the connection between the magnetic moment and the quantum angular momentum. You might remember from the previous discussion that a magnetic moment can be associated with an angular momentum. What we learn from quantum mechanics is that the angular momentum is quantized. If you apply wave mechanics to a hydrogen atom, the magnitude of the orbital magnetic moment is the square root of L L plus 1 times h bar, where L is called the azimuthal quantum number. The projection of the orbital angular momentum on the quantization axis is ML times h bar, where ML is called the magnetic quantum number and adopts all the integer values between minus L and plus L. As a consequence, the projection of the magnetic moment on the quantization axis is simply minus E over 2ME times ML h bar. In this expression, you see that the magnetic moment associated with the angular momentum is proportional to a quantum of magnetic moment called the Bohr magnetron. This Bohr magnetron is written mu b equal eh bar over 2me. This unit is very often used to quantify the magnetic moment of ions and solids and we will use it widely in the remaining of this lecture. The concept of the quantization of the electron orbital angular momentum was introduced by Bohr and Sommerfeld in the early 1920s. This quantization is based on what is now called the old model of the hydrogen atom. It was a very influential model and in 1922 Stern and Gela tried to observe this quantization of the orbital angular momentum. I have to emphasize that at that time there was no such thing as the electron spin. Only the electron orbital angular momentum was known. So the idea of Stern and Gela was the following. Because the electron possess a quantized orbital moment as well as, as a charge, it should possess a quantized magnetic moment. So if I submit this electron to a magnetic field, its magnetic moment will try to align on the magnetic field. The total energy will be described by what is called the Zeeman energy, which is simply minus mu, the magnetic moment, dot the magnetic field B. Now, if one manages to send a beam of electron or any particle with a non-zero magnetic moment for that matter, if one manages to, say, to send such a beam through a spatial gradient of magnetic field, this spatial gradient should induce a force on the moving magnetic moments and deflect their trajectory. As a consequence, it should be possible to deduce the magnitude of the particle's angular momentum from the deviation of its trajectory. How did they do that? They designed an apparatus in which a beam of silver atoms is sent between the two poles of a magnet. Because of this design, the magnetic field exhibits a gradient along the vertical direction. At the exit of the apparatus, they placed a glass plate to record the impact of the silver atoms. What was Stern and Gela searching for? Because remember, at that time the spin had not been discovered yet. What they did know though, was the theory developed not long before by Bohr and Sommerfeld that we now call the old quantum theory. The theory states that in a hydrogenoid atom, the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum of an electron must be quantized in terms of h bar, and its projection on the quantization axis should span from minus nh bar to plus nh bar. 
In the case of the hydrogen atom, only one electron rotates around the nucleus. And therefore, the projection of the orbital momentum should be minus h-bar or plus h-bar. So that is based on Sommerfeld's old quantum theory. Now you might notice that this theory is incomplete because it misses the projection m equals zero. But that's another story. Based on these ideas, Stern and Gera decided to use silver in their measurements. Because silver has 47 electrons and only one of them is impaired. In this case, silver should look like hydrogen atom and display only two projections of the magnetic moment, plus h-bar, minus h-bar. What was the expected result? In the classical picture, where there is no quantization, the projection of the orbital angular momentum along the field direction should be continuous and contain all the values between minus h-bar and plus h-bar. So, if you collect all the electrons traversing the apparatus, you should end up with a continuous line between these two extreme values. In the quantum picture, on the other hand, because the projection of the orbital momentum can only adopt two values, minus h-bar and plus h-bar, you should end up with only two spots. As you may know, Bohr's old quantum theory was driven by the interpretation of the hydrogen spectrum. In order to interpret the patterns in this spectrum, such as the Balmer's series, Bohr had to postulate the quantization of the electron orbital angular momentum. He introduced a new quantum number called the magnetic quantum number. Later, Sommerfeld refined the theory by introducing the quantization of the projection of the electron orbital angular momentum on the quantization axis. He introduced a new quantum number called the azimuthal number. The bohr sommerfeld theory was fine as it was able to interpret most of the hydrogen spectrum, but not all of it. Still, some small energy splitting were not accounted for by this model. In 1926, Uhlenbeck and Gutschmidt published a Nature paper where they claimed that they could account for those small splitting by introducing a new quantum number in addition to the azimuthal quantum number and the magnetic quantum number. At that time, Uhlenbeck and Gutschmidt were performing an internship with Ehrenfest, and they were trying to interpret or to understand the small splitting in the hydrogen spectrum. What they realized that they could understand those small splitting if they add a new quantum number that could only take two values. In the original theory, these two values are zero and one, but it quickly evolved towards what we know, plus one half and minus one half. Now what is interesting is that Uhlenbeck had a strong background in classical mechanics, and he pointed out that if one has to introduce a new quantum number, it is like introducing a new degree of freedom to the system. Since the azimuthal quantum number and the magnetic quantum number account for the spatial degree of freedom, then this new quantum number must account for the intrinsic degree of freedom. So in other words, it means that the electron has to spin over itself. That's the birth of the quantum electron spin. An interesting aspect of this new quantity is the ratio between the magnetic moment and the spin angular momentum. To interpret the hydrogen spectrum, this ratio had to be twice as large as the ratio between the magnetic moment and the orbital angular momentum. So in other words, while the magnetic moment associated with a spin is E over ME times h bar over 2, the magnetic moment associated with the orbital moment is E over 2 Me times h-bar. 
Let us come back to our main subject. So the magnetic moment of the electron has two contributions, the spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum. It can be expressed as minus mu b over h bar times gs Z spin contribution, plus gl Lz orbital contribution. gs and gl are the g factor for the spin and orbital moment. It is 2 for the spin, it is 1 for the orbital momentum. The brackets here denote quantum averaging. As a consequence, the magnetic moment of a material will be determined by three main effects. First, the electron-electron interaction will determine how two electron spins orient with respect to each other. Second, the chemical environment, the bonding between neighboring atoms, will determine the orbital contribution to the magnetic moment. Third, the spin and orbital momenta will have a tendency to align with each other through what is called the spin-orbit coupling. The three mechanisms will determine the magnetic properties of chemical compounds and materials. They will be the topic of the next lectures.